Well, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to folks around the world. This is Aditya Krujekar in Medici Studio. Welcome to Weekend Wisdom. Uh, my guest today is David Nault of Luge Capital. David, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me, and thanks everybody for who's listening in live over a weekend. Uh, it's that kind of hustle that I think will help you uh, achieve what you want. So our goal here is to uh, debunk and demystify uh, some of the myths and some of the pitfalls um, in venture capital. And I remember the first time uh, when I had a breakfast conversation with David and Kareem, um, I learned so much. Um, I learned about how uh, David looks at uh, his craft, so to speak. Would you mind introducing yourself and your fund to David firsthand to just get going? Sure. Um, so Luge Capital is a, uh, is a venture capital firm that invests in fintech and artificial intelligence applied to financial services. Uh, we're a fund that was started uh, two years ago. We have um, a mix of large funds that invest in us as well as financial institutions. So we get insights from them on what they're looking for and it helps us sharpen our investment thesis in investing in those companies. We invest both in the, uh, in the US and Canada. And prior to that, I was, uh, I was with uh, another venture capital firm called Inovia Capital in their early stage investment fund. And prior to that, um, I, did a, uh, I did a bunch of different entrepreneurial ventures, some of which worked, some of which did not. Um, so I've seen both sides of the fence. Thank you, David. Um, you know, just for those in the audience here, uh, we have a few people joining us here on Zoom and the advantage of doing that is that you get to ask questions. Um, we might have some time in the end for a couple of questions. So, um, you know, just, just so you know, you don't have to um, ask them um, on video. You just have to type them in the chat and then I will look at it and I will ask David. We are also live streaming this on YouTube, LinkedIn and Twitter. So welcome everyone there. And this will obviously be published on Medici Studio after. So. I want to jump right in here, um, David, and ask you about uh, something that I have heard many times. Um, you know, the, the classic, we love your business. It's great what you've built, but is that something you do often? <laughs> um, you no, know, it's something that uh, definitely every, every VC does, does often. And, you know, the, um, there are a lot of reasons why an investor can say no, and some of which are in the control of an entrepreneur and some of which are not in the control of an entrepreneur. And, you know, the, not every investor, um, you know, explains why they don't invest. And it's, it, you know, that's why I think the subject is an interesting subject. An entrepreneur should know that they're, you know, one to 2% of the deals that investors look at, they actually invest in. Um, and, you know, starting with uh, the things that are not within the control of the entrepreneur is, is fit with the firm. And we like your business, but it's just not a fit for our firm or, or our investment thesis. Um, and the earlier you know that, the more you can move on to an investor that, that where there's a, there's a fit. Um, and, you know, a little tip for entrepreneurs is, you know, you can look at their portfolio, what they invest in, the sectors, the geography, the fund partners to get really a good sense of what they invest in. Um, you know, the stage that they invest in, some investors invest later, some investors invest, invest much earlier. Um, so those are all things that, that you, can, you can look at, but yeah, you know, the, the, the common answer is not really a fit for, for us at this time. And when you say fit, um, you know, I, I'm assuming there's a couple of, dimensions to that fit, uh, right? One of the dimensions could be that you have other portfolio companies uh, that, uh, that have a bearing on where you invest next. I mean, is that, is that typically a consideration that you would not invest in a company which might be competitive to something that you already own? For sure, portfolio construction is, a, is an important part of building a VC model. When, when venture capital firms raise money, um, you know, they, they, they invested based on, a, based on a sector, based on a thesis, on stage, um, and all of those things come into play. And, and successful investors invest in portfolio companies that can complement each other um, 
and investors build a network to help those companies. They build um, an, a, a intelligence around that sector that ultimately ends up helping the success of their, their portfolio. So you know, almost no investor will invest in competitive businesses, overlapping businesses, uh, but really that does factor in very much so is, is portfolio construction in terms of fit with the fund. Right. And I, I want to go back to the other uh, piece here about, um, you know, the fund itself and the fact that, look, I mean, when I was, you know, a middle manager in a big company, um, you know, there were some things I couldn't do because I always had a boss who would basically, you know, he could, he could change what I was thinking. And even when you are CEO, you have a boss, you have the board. Now you are a board member. Do you have a boss? Is there somebody above you? Absolutely. You know, we, we, we are the custodians of money for our investors. And when we deploy that capital, entrepreneurs are custodians of that money um, that they're, they, are, they are going to be putting, putting to work. Um, every fund has LPs, limited partners, that they, they, they answer to. They need to provide returns to. So, you know, we're, we're, um, we, we also have bosses, if you will, that we need to, uh, we need to satisfy. And I think, I think that's where, um, you know, what I have learned in my conversations with my VC friends over the years is that you just have to understand what is it that people are solving for, right? Uh, the founder is obviously solving for raising money, simple, right? I mean, you want capital and you want to build a business. Um, and you are obviously solving for return on capital for somebody else. And I think there are so many different factors here, um, you know, for where uh, the stage, the size, the market, the theme, uh, I'm sure they all uh, play into it. Um, I want to focus on one of the cliches that we hear a lot about um, people investing in people uh, as opposed to people investing in businesses. And I want to ask the question in a negative way just to make the point. Um, is there any such thing as an unfundable founder? You know, wonderful idea, great concept, love the business model, fantastic opportunity, but I wish this idea had come to me from somebody else other than this guy or gal pitching to me. Does that happen? Uh, yes, unfortunately it does. Um, and you know, not, a, not every entrepreneur, not every startup should raise venture capital. And you know, I admire also those that are able to build a successful business. Um, back when I was in, when I was in payments, we didn't, we didn't raise any money. Uh, and we became a, a very successful company north of, of $100 million of revenue, and it's continued to grow um, since then. Now, the, the you know, investors for invest first and foremost in, in team. It is a long-term relationship. It is like a marriage, and you will hear this a lot. Um, and, you know, to build a successful company, it takes a lot of passion, agility, and, and, and will. And so, you know, first and foremost, we look at team. And, and you know, one of the tests um, of a founder relationship is during the due diligence process, if, you know, things become one-sided, if the entrepreneur doesn't follow up on a timely matter, um, if, you know, they, they, they're negotiating terms of a term sheet and are, and are being overly difficult. Those are all, you know, yellow flags or red flags for, for both parties, right? You might have an entrepreneur that just feel, doesn't feel comfortable with, with, the, with the investor or the partner on the, on the deal. But for sure, you know, we invest in, in great teams um, because ultimately, you know, they're the ones that are, that are controlling the ship. Are there any unwritten rules here that VCs have that are not documented? For example, right? Oh, we always want at least one tech founder, right? Uh, you know, we always want somebody from an Ivy League school, or we always want, uh, you know, somebody who's done something similar before. Are there, and, you know, I understand that some of these things, you know, just because of the sensitivity of, of, of all of us wanting to, you know, um, even inadvertently not feel like we're discriminating, um, are there unwritten rules in your, in your world that, that people should know? Or maybe no, I don't. <laughs> I've learned over the years that, you know, founders that have that X factor that don't fit the mold are often those that, 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 that become successful. It is not because you have, a, you have an MBA from Harvard that you're not going to make it. 
Um, it is not because you failed five times in the past that this time you're not going to make it. So, you know, we, I personally never judge a founder from the get-go, no matter what shape, size, background they come from. Um, but, you know, to your point about, you know, what are their, their hard skills and soft skills? Yes, that's super important. Personally, you know, I think, especially in an early stage company, founders need to know how to sell, right? You need to sell to investors. You need to sell to team members to convince them to embark on your journey, especially if you can't afford maybe the salaries that they're, they're used to, to getting. So, you know, sales is important. Sales is, for, is important for early stage traction with customers, selling them on the, on the concept instead of, the, instead of necessarily the, the, the finished product. So for sure sales. Now, you know, in the tech business, a founder that understands the technology, for sure that's, that's, that's important. You need to be able to guide your, your team. And we've seen companies fail where the founder has just not been able to get a good grasp on the technology and the, and the tech team has not brought this in the direction of the vision and, and the customer needs. So you know, a good mix of tech and a good mix of sales, people skills, uh, management skills, those are all things that um, I think are important for an early stage uh, founder. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that stage uh, for a bit. And you know, when I was at Verizon in a biz dev role and Karim knows this well, I used to make fun of my um, colleagues on the venture side saying that, guys, I'm bringing the deal to you fully vetted. What risk are you taking? You're not venture investing, you're just investing. I've done all the, I've done all the due diligence as the biz dev guy. And you know, one of the criticisms that I hear from people saying that, oh, the investor said that, I wish you had already a glide path for your revenue, then I would have come in. But then why do I need your money? So, <laughs> I've, I've, heard, I've heard that before. I've heard that from, from founders saying, well, you know, I need your money now. I'm not going need to it, need it later. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, um, there, there are investors that have an appetite for very early stage investing when things are completely unproven. And there are investors that have an appetite for a little bit later on. And every fund is, is different. Some will invest in seed, pre-seed, just the concept. Some of them will invest when things are a little bit more proven. But you know, one recommendation to entrepreneurs is that you know, always keep in mind that one day you might need growth funding or you might need funding at a next stage. And sometimes funding is really about accelerating growth. And there are you know, businesses and entrepreneurs that can make it with, with little money. But it, you know, once you know that there's a trade-off between dilution and there's a trade-off between going, going quicker. So, you know, I think, I think entrepreneurs um, have something to gain sometimes by raising money, accepting a little bit more dilution and, and going, going faster. Now, there's a lot of reasons why a business can fail, and all of those reasons are valid reasons for, for an investor to say, to say no. Um, you can't do every one of the deals that you, that you look at, and you got to have comfort around the sector, around the team, around the thesis, around the market. There, there are a lot of things that come into play there. And you know, I think just as with anything else in life, I think there's always a reason why people do anything. Right? You may not understand it at the time, but from that person's perspective, there is a reason. Right? Mm -hmm. and, it's a reason. And, to that, and to that point, you know, there's a, the, I believe a lot in the what, why a founder is doing something and not necessarily what they are doing. Mm -hmm. What is driving them to want to go and solve this problem? Um, you know, we, we backed a, a, a founder in cybersecurity for financial institutions called Flare Systems. And this founder lived the problem within a financial institution and did not have the solution and was so compelled to develop one that he, he left his job and went and actually started the solution. And, you know, I love those kinds of founders that have lived that problem before and really the, the, they're, they're passionate about trying to make it happen. Because at the end of the day is, you know, it is very difficult to build a company. And when things get very, very difficult, you fall back on you know, your belief and your mission and your drive to make this happen because it is deeper than just the what you are doing and the financial gain. 
So we talked about uh, the stage, we talked about the team, uh, but obviously the, the business and the team sits in um, the environment you are in, the market you are in, right? How big, how big of a factor um, is the market fit, so to speak? Uh, you know, how do you characterize that in your you know, decision to say yes or no? Yeah, the um, you know it's a it's a it's a good question. You'll hear this from from investors. Is you know I I like the business, I like you, but I just don't think the market is big enough. And mind you, investors don't have a crystal ball. But we try to rely rely on on data, on industry insights. I mean, for us, we speak a lot to financial institutions and understand the pains pains that they have and how big that pain is. And is it, a, is it a vitamin or a painkiller for them? Is it a priority for them? And is this a potential to be you know, a massive company in a massive market? Um, and you look at geography and you say, is this, is this a business that you know, can compete not only geographically, but you know, worldwide to build a large company? My partner came from PayPal, right? And Zoom, which was acquired by PayPal, a worldwide solution. So you know those those are the kinds of businesses that return big for for investors. And when you when you look at the venture math behind a venture capital fund, a lot of companies do not succeed. So you need really a few that outperform um, that will return the fund. At the end of it all, you know the power law of there are a few companies that will return the whole fund. So in order for that to happen, it's got to be a massive market. It really, it really does. And, you know, a tip for founders is, is really, you know, help, help the investor understand your numbers, right? Why you believe that this is a big market and more so on the big market is, is there tailwind in the industry, right? Is this a rising market that will lift all boats, right? So there's, there is, when you, when you've got headwind and you're, you're, you're fighting against the market, the more the market is growing, the more likelihood you are to to succeed and the more room there will be for you and, you know it's not because that there's not that there's competition that um you know investors will not necessarily invest sometimes it's it's validation on the opportunity but can you capture your share of the market in a large market and eventually are there acquirers for that business as well because it's one thing to get into a business and invest but it's another thing to exit and get out so you know the, 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 the bigger the opportunity, the more likelihood of the, the deep pocket and acquirers for that business down the road. So for sure, you know, the, the market size is, is an important factor. So with everything um, that, that we all do as you know, data-driven analytical people who, who want to use a lot of our left brain in making decisions, there's also the right brain. Um, and in the spirit of um, m making all my guests a little bit uncomfortable, I'm going to ask you this, right? Have you, have you made investments um, where you were, you were probably not fully convinced about the data and what that was telling you? But you knew, you knew there was something else. Maybe it was momentum. Maybe it was FOMO. Maybe it was just, I know there is something here. Do you do that? So... Whenever we make an investment, we, we, there are lots of unknowns and we have to get comfort over those unknowns. We're not in the, in, the, in the venture capital business because everything is proven. But you try to align you know, the, the, the risk with the reward and that this entrepreneur is gonna solve these problems or prove out these problems. And investors often reinvest more capital along the way. So you might make a first check and unfortunately the company does not succeed. Um, but in the way in which a venture capital fund operates is that you want to double down on the companies every step of the way that continue to outperform. Um, so, you know, to that, to that, to that point, um, you know, it, not everything is proven at the beginning. However, you know, the, the, the thing that speaks loudly for sure for entrepreneurs is traction does remove doubt. Um, but the later that we get in, the more we're going to pay, right? The more, the more, okay. the, the, the more, the less we're going to get in return. I mean, you invest a million dollar check in a $4 million business is different than investing a million dollar check at a $50 million valuation. So 
you know, they're, 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 you got to weigh that as, a, as an investor. We're an early stage investor investing in seed and, and series A as our sweet spot. And then we'll continue to reinvest in, in those companies. Um, but sometimes too, you know, the, the, the business is just too early, right? It's, it's interesting, but it's, it's still, there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are fairly unproven that we can't get comfort over. Um, will the company be able to build a product? You know, will the product work? Will the technology work? Will even customers even accept it? Will you be able to beat out maybe some of the some of the early competitors in the in the market? And so, you know, founders have a have also a vested interest in in showing some of those proof points because then they will also get a better valuation. So it, it works on both sides as well. And we've had you know businesses that have approached us as listen, I just want you to make make you aware of what we are doing, and I'm going to come back and see you once I've done this, and then we can yeah. we can we can talk. And, you know, that is a strategy of a, of a founder to start getting interest, building their pipeline of investors, but going out and proving a few things. And, you know, contrary to maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, building a startup requires often less capital, at least to start proving some, some, some stuff, right? It's, it's, so with, with cloud and with, 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 um, with open source and with, with um, you know some of the tech around there, some, somebody can prove out what they're doing. So for sure, there is traction will remove doubt, but there's also FOMO is a real thing, right? Um, maybe not every investor will say it, but you know when you see a founder that you believe that they will succeed with or without you, um, it's always attractive to be to be making sure that you are on top of that that deal, and not every you know, stage you will invest and you got to build that, that investor needs to build that relationship with that entrepreneur, because at the next phase, you want them to choose you because outperforming entrepreneurs have the choice of money that they want. Investors will, will try to sell you on taking, taking their money. So if you built a good relationship with the entrepreneur, you've been able to help them. And that's something that we try to do as well is even though we, we might not be ready to write the check today, we try to help them so that they think, positively about us at a next round of funding or when they are ready to raise funding, introducing them to a customer, introducing them to talent, to advisor, maybe introducing them to another investor um, that invests maybe a little bit early or an angel investor. And we see that uh, partnership being played amongst the VCs as well, where a later stage VC might say, hey, I really like this founder. I like this business a little early for us but why don't you take a look at it? And that referral goes a long way as well from, from a trusted investor or entrepreneur saying, I like this, I wanna write a small check inside of them. Um, and then you know, you, we, can, we can invest more, uh, more later on. But you know, the, the little tip for, for, for entrepreneurs is you wanna, you wanna try to convince them that your train is leaving and you know, they, they need to get on it, right? So you know, the, the, the Keeping them up to date, um, feeding them with information, progress on how things are going. You got to look at this as an evolving relationship as well with investors, future investors at the next yeah. stage, but also current investors in your in your pipeline. And you know, some some people might not realize that just as you know, a, a good founder uh, with a good sales mindset uh, is very um, focused on the CRM the sales pipeline. Similarly, good VCs have a CRM. You have a pipeline, right? You are proactively working that pipeline, which leads to your portfolio, right? Um, how often do you go back to the no's in your pipeline and convert them into a yes on your own accord? Yeah. Um, you know, we are, we are just like a, just like an entrepreneur, you know, with their with their customers and and building their pipeline, we do as well. We've got, you know, well over a thousand companies that are actively inside of our our own deal flow, and so we uh, we want to keep up to date as well. So we will reach out and, and and outbound entrepreneurs that we maybe haven't spoken to for a quarter or two. We'll put them on our track list um, to see their progress of how they're doing. We'll create touch points to, to get an update with them. 
we will try to you know demonstrate our value as well by introducing them to to different people inside of our our own network so we we do build the pipeline and we do follow up with entrepreneurs to make sure that we're there at the right point in time and um you know is it is it always it is is it always that you have to initiate uh, the uh, you know the conversion so to speak of of um, uh, I mean, okay, I should ask it a different way, right? You have a pipeline of a thousand deals or right, a thousand uh, opportunities in your pipeline. Um, a good founder, a, right? A good entrepreneur who's raising money probably has a pipeline of, I don't know, maybe 50, right? VCs in his l- list of people that he should be reaching out to. Um, is, it, is it always true that it is the founder who's pinging the investor multiple times, keeping him up to date. Look, here's what's going on. Here's how I've made progress. Can we talk again? Or have you seen that in your experience now shifting that the VC is also checking in a bit more often? Is that balance shifting over time? So there, there are funds out there that are very, very good at this, um, that will have a whole team that does outreach to entrepreneurs um, to, build, to build that pipeline. And you know we definitely you know, outbound entrepreneurs. When we, when we think about a sector that we like and we don't have a company in that sector, we will scan the market and we will find entrepreneurs and we will, we will reach out to them. And it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a inbound and combination of inbound and outbound. The, you know, the, the, the likelihood of doing a deal on a cold call email or a form filled out on a website is highly unlikely. Right. You know, for, for entrepreneurs, the, the better, if you can get a referral to an investor, you go up on their priority list. You know, you, investors can be sidetracked, sidetracked by so many different things, fundraising, helping companies, exiting in the middle of a financing of a, of a, of a new deal or an existing company. And when a trusted entrepreneur or a portfolio CEO or a co-investor says, hey, Aditya, I think you should be looking at this opportunity. It goes a long way, and the follow-up obviously is 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 much quicker. So you know those referrals. I'd say you know the the the, the likelihood of a deal is an outbound, a referral, um, somebody that we've seen at an event, we've seen them pitch. They came from a trusted accelerator uh, or incubator. Um, so those are all sort of the hierarchy of interest level of a company. We have a question here um, from Luis about, um, about investing in, in a particular sector. So I'm just gonna ask you a more general question. As you look at where we are today, uh, both in terms of, um, of the um, space FinTech that we are all focused on, as well as the time we are in with everything going on around us, are there particular sectors that are more interesting to you than others like wealth tech? Is that an interesting sector for you? Are there any others top of mind that you're looking at right now? Yeah, good question. You know, the, um, this, the, the, the new reality of the market has shifted a little bit the, 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 the priorities for investors and of course for customers as well. So, you know, the, um, the, the sectors that, that are for sure of interest is you know, investing in today's in today's market when the market might be might might be going down, um, there are there are you know tailwind in that industry for using more data to better understand um, you know how the how the market will will react, uh, the likelihood of performance of a of a portfolio. But if you think of you know insurance companies too, is you know especially because of COVID. Uh, there's there's very little face to face that is happening in insurance, right? You can't go in somebody's house and take a take a blood sample and 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 you know ask them for for their health check, um, and so you know there there are sectors like that 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 have tailwind, but there's also another piece of this whole thing is that I think what is what what today's market has done also for investors is it's amplified the the way in which they look at companies. So you know they they companies that have proven maybe a few more proof points, uh, companies that have a little bit more, you know, customer interest and can show that 
uh, you know, in today that there's even more upswing. And we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing businesses that have more upswing. I mean, you think of cashless payments, um, contactless payments. You know, we made a very small check in a company called, called Tip Tap Payments. You know, all about, you know, accepting payments without necessarily touching physical money. So you're seeing an increase in, in those, kinds of, those kinds of businesses. But wealth tech is, is, you know, is a sector too that we're seeing, um, you know, the aging of the population trying to, you know, make sure that they have enough money for, for retirement. Um, everything digital, the digital transformation, this whole, you know, situation has become a digital reality check for financial institutions um, and they put to test a lot of a lot of their 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 the, the products that they have out in the out in the market, like how people interact with financial services. You don't walk into a branch, at least you don't want to walk into a branch if you don't have to, and that's put some strain on the technologies. And so they're looking also at technologies that can help them innovate much quicker. We have a question here from Taran about early stage investing that you have done or you do? I mean, what's the earliest that you've invested you do seed stage and what would be some metrics that, that allow you to um, decide even at, at such an early stage that this is the right thing for you to do? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. The, um, when we invested in a company in New York called, uh, called Till, which is a bank for kids. Uh, Pre-product, we invested just really on the, on the idea. So we've invested checks way, way at the beginning. We've also invested checks when there's been, there's been you know, a million and plus in, in revenue. There's no minimum check for us. Uh, we will invest uh, very early on. But you know, of course, the, the more that the, the, the team you know, can prove that they're, they, they're, they're able to deliver a product, um, that they, they understand the market, they've done their research, the more proof points that they have, of course, the, the, the better likelihood it is of, of getting funding. There's a, there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, and so you know, we will invest in, especially in a sector that we have a thesis on that we, there, are, there are almost no players inside of it. Um, so we will, we will invest in those, especially early because we can't find a company yet that's, that's, that's building that. Uh, so we will invest in, in a team that, uh, that has that, that vision. Right. Um, we'll take only one more question here uh, from the audience. It's from Onur. Um, it usually takes time and a full product of companies in regulated industries to get approval from regulators. Um, and it needs more capital than most founders' ability to bootstrap. Do you still require traction for such companies? What's your approach in general? I don't know how you want to answer that, but... Um, you know, regulatory is a is a a two sided um, situation where where if you can get past the whole regulatory, you've got defensibility because not everybody can get can get through that. Um, at the flip side, is also a risk because you know th there is a probability that, that that you might not and, and you could be uh, you you could be stopped. So um, you know in in. Some of those businesses, once again, I mean, it's, it's in, in general, all businesses, you can invest very, very early at a lower valuation when things are not proven. And it's all about getting comfort over, over those things that are unproven versus a little bit later when things are, are proven. Personally, we have, we have an appetite for, for early stage companies, but there's also something to know about a fund is the later that they get in their fund cycle, and when I say fund cycle is a fund is 10 years. The first five years, they make new investments. Second, second five years, they reinvest in the best companies. They don't make new investments. They raise another fund, right? So the later that you get in your investment period, the less likelihood you are of making a, an early stage investment. So entrepreneurs should also understand where the fund is in their investment cycle. Um, and you know, the, the first year, they'll be making very, very early bets. The fifth year, they'll be making a little bit of later, later, uh, later bets. So it's, it's all about having appetite at the risk and the entrepreneur being able to prove that they're cognizant and they, 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 they have a, a way of which they're going to address that risk. And if the investor is comfortable, the check is, the check is, is written. Right. I'm going to ask you one last question here and then would love your closing remarks um, you know, before we wrap. Um, have founders said no to you? <laughs> um, We've, we've had, for sure, we've had investors, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs that have, that have decided to choose 
another investor. We've also had deals that we've won, um, maybe at terms that were the valuation was not as high as another investor, but they wanted to choose us because of the value that we, we could bring. But it's a good point. Entrepreneurs can also say no, and they should also say no sometimes when it goes against everything that they, they believe in and they just don't feel comfortable with that investor. Optionality for the entrepreneur is, is a good situation to be in. You've got the choice of different investors and you know, the more kind of term sheets, the more interest you have, the more you can choose the right fit. But you know, it's part of the game too, is not every, not every investor's entrepreneur is gonna choose uh, uh, you as an investor. You gotta prove your value too. It's a, we sell ourselves also in deals that are highly competitive and that we wanna get in. If the entrepreneur's comp can creating a competitive process, they're in a better, very good situation. Uh, on that note, I want to thank you again. I think it's about um, communication in both directions, um, being true to what you're solving for as an investor and being true to what you're solving for as an entrepreneur. And you both have valid reasons to say no to each other. I think that's the competitive investment marketplace, I guess, that we live in. Um, David, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts so candidly. Uh, what we're going to do here uh, for those uh, who choose to read uh, what was said is uh, David has very graciously written up a blog uh, which covers all of the points that we have covered today and we'll be publishing that on Medici in the coming week. Uh, so look out for that. And um, I want to also thank my friend and your partner Karim Jilani for making this happen. Uh, with that, David, thank you for visiting us here uh, on Weekend Wisdom. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the, uh, the entrepreneurs and the people that, that joined. Feel free to reach out to us. Luge Capital on Twitter, David Alt on LinkedIn, um, and all of our other social channels and luge.bc, L-U-G-E dot B-C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.